Okay, so picking up where we left off yesterday in class, uh, we're going to shift gears here and focus on the Mongols. And that's really where we're going to stay for the rest of the, the chapter. So make sure, obviously, your notes on, you know, the Arabs and the Turks and all that are pretty strong because we're going to go, like, real deep here on the Mongols. And so the first question or, or first answer to what is the Mongols' legacy, what are they known for, remembered for, is quite simply how big an empire they presided over. Um, the Mongols continue to this day to have um, put together the largest land-based empire in history. And the curious ones amongst you might read that and think, well, oh, geez, what's the largest empire in history or sea-based empire? And the answer to that is um, the British Empire, which comes later. But as far as a land-based empire, what the Mongols managed to do was to effectively like take over most of, of Eurasia. Um, they linked all the lands of the nomadic, dominated inner Eurasia with the coastal civilizations in China um, and, and, and elsewhere. And so that is um, obviously a huge accomplishment in and of itself, but it's less about how much land they ruled and more about what they um, what they allowed to happen or what they encouraged to happen that is their true legacy. Um, and for that, we have to like explain the idea that when you are able to basically take over most of, of Eurasia, you are linking together um, civilizations that had to this point had very little contact with each other, right? If you can get under one imperial rule, the lands of Eastern Europe in China and the Islamic world all together, then you have just connected some of the world's like greatest civilizations and you're going to preside over exchange, right? And it's the exchange that's important. The next thing that I think just a cool factoid perhaps is that they did this um, with an astonishingly small amount of Mongol population, right? The total Mongol population was only 700,000. That's about the, the number of people that live in the Colorado Springs metropolitan area, right? And imagine it, with just the people in the Colorado Springs metropolitan area, we took over all of Canada, all the United States, and all of Mexico, right? It's pretty incredible, especially since out of that 700,000, probably only 300,000 were actually like warriors or able to be warriors. Um, and so, you know, they did this with an astonishingly small number of people um, and brought together like civilizations and connected people as they've never been before, um, but really didn't themselves leave a major cultural impact on the world, right? It is not like the Islamic empires that took over places and then, you know, from that point on in history, they're, they're Muslim, right? Or, you know, when when Christian, like the Holy Roman Empire or Charlemagne took over most of Europe, now most of Europe is, is Christian or um, all the other cultural impacts that empires leave behind, the Mongols did very little, right? You've never met anyone in your life that practices the Mongol religion of ancestor worship or shamanism, right? And you don't really know people that speak Mongolian, probably. And, you know, the yurt, like building structure never caught on. And so I think that gets to sort of what we saw in yesterday's do now. The tolerance for other religions was largely because they weren't really interested in, in ruling people or exploiting people. That was very uninteresting to them. They were interested in the accomplishment, number one, and number two, um, the financials of it all, right? By bringing all those people together under such a huge empire, Genghis Khan had, you know, allowed himself to be the, the uniter and ruler of the world, essentially. But they also made a scary amount of money, right? Because you're taxing all the trade and, and that's all they really cared about, right? Like, we're going to take you over. You can keep doing what you're doing. We don't care, but you're going to pay us um, and largely we'll leave you alone. And when the Mongol, Mongol Empire ended um, at, around the time of the Black Plague, which weakened them and we'll get to later, um, and they retreated and, and withdrew back to their ancestral homelands, that was really it, right? Like it was a flash in the pan. Mongol culture today is, is largely confined to Mongolia. It has very little impact other places. 
And when they withdrew, like that pretty much marked the, like I said at the beginning of this chapter, sort of the, the death rattle of the pastoral societal um, era of dominance. The Mongol Empire was the last great nomadic state. And here is th this map that really, I think, shows exactly what was accomplished, right? And so let's take a look at it. 1206, 1219, 1223, 1227, 1237, 1259, 1279, right? Like it is only about 90 years long to conquer all of that. And you can see India largely um, unscathed and, you know, well, let me ask you this and then I'll tell you, why do you think that is? Correct answer? Himalayans. Geographic luck, right? The geography really provided a safeguard and a wall um, for the civilizations of India to largely, like, to dodge that. And Southeast Asia never fell because horse-based people really struggle in jungles. Um, and Arabia never fell because, again, horses are really, like, rough in um, desert areas on sand. But all the other lands, like, that's a, astonishingly big. And, you know, here's a picture of those steppe regions I'm talking about and traditional Mongol, um, like, garb and, and horse-based people. Um, what's, you can see, if you had been, like, lived and born in a land like that, why horse culture would be so dominant. In Mongol culture, kids or babies learned how to ride before they could walk. And their first drink, just to kind of symbolize the bond between human and in horses, their first drink was not their mom's milk. It was um, horse or mare's milk, right? Um, here's some more pictures. You can, again, see that land on the right. Like, again, if you're a horse-based people, that's pretty sweet. Um, okay, so... Let's talk about the story of the Mongol Empire. And for those of you who like history and they like you love a good war movie or battle movie with that's exciting and bloody and all that kind of stuff, there is a really great movie um, on Netflix last time I checked called Mongol. Um, and it's the story of Genghis Khan. Um, but the story of Genghis Khan is a really interesting one in history, right? Genghis Khan was born by the name Temujin or Temujin. He was born in 1162 and died in 1227. You can do the math there. That's He lived to be 65 years old, so a good age at that time, but not an astonishingly old age. Temujin became Genghis Khan and created the Mongol Empire. Um, and this story of what he was able to do begins kind of in that time period pre-Mongol unification, where I told you, like, the Mongols had largely, like, organized themselves as tribes, um, moving nomadically along the steppe region with their herds. Um, the tribes had a lot of like internal conflict between tribes and blood feuds and, and whatnot. And this boy, Temujin, um, he was born basically the son of a, a minor uh, Mongol chieftain um, who was murdered by a rival of his when Temujin was only 10. So at 10 years old, um, Temujin had lost his father and was now um, a, basically the son of a single mom. Um, but because Temujin's father was a minor chieftain, when his father was murdered, Temujin and his mother and siblings were exiled from the tribe, right? They were a threat, right? Because Temujin was the son of the former chief. And so they were exiled. And Temujin's mother um, did what was pretty amazing at the time, which is not only hold the family together, um, but raise them not in the security of the clan, right? They detached from the clan. They lived on the steppe regions by themselves, moving around their small group of livestock, um, but they were deserted by the clan. And, you know, I think this really gets to an interesting thing is how many people in human history, how many great leaders um, were basically born or raised in hardship, right? Like we talked about Muhammad was an orphan and you know, Buddha, right, like left everything behind and, and kind of, um, well, I don't know, like kind of did his own thing by himself, like leading the hard life. Temujin was the, the son raised by a single mom. And, you know, in the absence of that clan, Temujin's personality really started to step up, right? And, and because he was such a magnetic and strong personality, a strong natural leader, 
he basically developed this group of friends that became sort of like his crew, like his boys, right? It was him and four others. And they were kind of like in it together, thick and thin, um, getting in trouble. It was their crew. And he was unquestionably um, kind of the leader. And, you know, him and his five, um, ultimately, because he was brilliant, like truly brilliant, he was able to ally himself with more powerful tribal leaders, um, him and his and his um, friends, uh, obviously all very strong and capable fighters and allied himself. And, and he would play one tribal leader off of another and he would betray people and trade up when, you know, they outgrew and and through a s shifting series of alliances and betrayals and military victories, um, he basically began to get this reputation as he was a great leader. A lot of people were following him. He was, you know, strong and tough and really smart with a magnetic personality. And so in 1206, again, at the do the math, at the age of 44 years old, um, Temujin had, you know, raised by a single mom, sort of formed his own tribe out of his friends, um, and then sort of positioned himself by 1206 when he called, or they called, a Mongol tribal assembly, where all the tribes would send a leader and basically come together. And the tribal assembly recognized Temujin as the great Khan, the universal ruler, Chinggis Khan. And Chinggis Khan um, effectively like, promised them that he would bring greatness to the Mongol people. What I think is interesting in this picture is the different artistic styles based on the country of origin, right? Like the bottom right hand is probably more of a Mongolian feature set. The one on the left is, is very Chinese. Um, the one in the upper right was much more Central Asian. And so you can see how people's faces get interpreted based on the culture in which the art is produced. Um, and so continuing the story of Temujin, right? Temujin, he's crowned um, universal ruler of Genghis Khan at 44 years old. And then he's like, well, crap, I've managed to unite the clans in a way that hasn't been done before and they hate each other. So how do I keep them from killing each other? And the answer to that is the same thing that many empires do, right? If you want to hold people together, you give them a common enemy. And so he basically turned his eye um, to conquering, to expansion, as his dominant method to keep his followers together, to keep them from turning on each other. He, in 1209, five years after kind of get, gathering the tribes and, and conquering some lands, turned his attention on China the world's greatest empire at this time. And over the next 50 years, um, you know, it carried on after he died and his grandson, Kubla Khan, um, picked it up. But over the next 50 years, the Mongols um, spent conquering and, and pacifying China. This were, these were his boys, right? This was his inner circle. It was Genghis Khan, Ogadai, Manke, and his grandson, or uh, Kublai. Right. And he created an empire, as we saw on the map, that included China, Korea, Central Asia, Russia, much of the Middle East, and even into the lands of Eastern Europe, what made Poland today. Um, now, you know, as far as what stopped him, as I already alluded to, the jungles of Southeast Asia, the desert sands of Arabia, um, and, and really just a really interesting story um, is the Japanese invasions. And you can see he tried invading Japan twice. Um, and, and really just a fun story is uh, when the Mongols tried to invade Japan, they spent all this time building a fleet. And they're very uncomfortable in open waters because, you know, they're a horse-based people. And so open oceans are, are very just unsettling to them. And so they build this great fleet to bring forth their armies across the Sea of Japan to land. And after spending two years building this fleet, they set sail in mid-journey, a, a cyclone comes out of nowhere, which is like the Pacific version of a hurricane, comes out of nowhere and destroys the fleet. And they go, well, crap, and they get set back to redo it, all right? And they spend the next five years rebuilding the fleet to launch another invasion. And in 1281, they, they set off, and the same thing happened again, which in Japanese lore is like the island protected itself, and the island gods 
um, sent that storm to protect. 